get started. We got a lot of stuff to cover. I want to get through things, right? We have to cover a lot of background material so we have enough knowledge to understand the actual attack that we're talking about, right? If I could, uh, I mean, I can just teach attacks, right? But without like knowing x86 and knowing how the stack works, you can learn at a high level what a buffer overflow is, but that doesn't give you enough knowledge to actually go execute it yourself. Um, so that's what we're doing here in the web context too, right? We're going through and understanding how the web works so we can understand the security uh, problems here. So we looked at what are the three main technologies in the web? URLs. HTML, it's on the screen, that barely counts. HTTP. HTTP, yes, right? URLs give us a way to make an HTTP request, which gives us an HTML page, which contains new URLs, which we can use to make HTTP requests to get HTML, right? These are the core building blocks of the web. If you understand these, understand how they work, you've come a long way in your understanding of the web and web applications. Um, and I guess I'll also emphasize, I didn't talk about it much, but do you do a lot of your web browsing on your computer? Probably, on your laptop. What about your phone? Right, so do you actually actively browse the web in a browser on your phone? Yes. What about the apps that you use? Right, so we've actually done some research and we've shown that a lot of apps actually are just a browser. They're an embedded browser loading HTML code, either from a remote site or from somewhere on local on the device. Um, so even, this is also why this stuff is increasingly relevant. It's not just that we're talking about browsers and websites, but the web and web technologies have uh, proliferated all types of technology. Anybody develop any of the Windows, or like, I, I don't know, I want to call them Metro apps, but I know that's like the super old term for them, like the, the full screen style apps, where they'll work on like the Windows and on Windows Phone. Nobody's done any work on that? Mm. Not good news for Microsoft. <laughs> um, anyways, the, you can actually, so you can write that code in C sharp, but actually the way they recommend you do that is using HTML and JavaScript, right? Technologies that they took from the web to develop a completely native app that has the, the same functionality as the C sharp code or even the C code. And actually, it's really cool. You can use all three. So you can have JavaScript code, call C sharp code, you can have those called C code and it all works and it'll work across all your devices, which is really cool. Um, so, the last technology that we need to talk about is the hypertext markup language. So, it, this is, so it's simple, I guess it's kind of in quotes here, right? A simple data format, right? It is, it's simple in the sense that it's human readable, Right? You can, on any web page, you can right click and say view source, and you'll be able to see the HTML of that page. Whether you agree that it's simple or not simple, I would, I would agree that it's an arguable point. Uh, but the key point is that we can have HTML documents, we've defined this language such that these hypertext documents, when they're interpreted by your phone, or by your computer, or by your laptop, or by a giant supercomputer, right, they're still parsed and represented the same. Um, so this is actually, so HTML is based on SGML, which was a, a prior standard in 1986. Uh, HTML, so a little bit of history, HTML 2.0 uh, was proposed in November 1995. HTML 3.2 was proposed as a recommendation in 1997. HTML 4.1 was proposed in 1999. Then they went down this weird track where they were like, well, we have XML and we have HTML. If you know a little bit more about the details about HTML, you know that it's not valid XML. So they were like, well, and this is actually, so I'll say, part of the reason why I love going over the history of this stuff is because I had no idea about all the differences between XHTML and HTML. Like I would just code websites and hope that they work, um, <laughs> which I think is how a lot of people do this. Uh, so XHTML, they're like, let's merge this. We're gonna have, you have to write an HTML and it has to be valid XML. Uh, and so this was in January of 2000. And then everybody hated it and nobody really adopted <laughs> it. So then they were like, oh God, okay. So let's go back to HTML. We'll change the HTML5 spec. 
And so this actually, so you can see the huge gap, 2000 to 2014. There's a 14 year gap between any new standards instances of HTML. Um, and then HTML 5.1 is currently under development and they're actually treating the HTML5 spec now as what they call a living specification. So it's continually being adapted and updated. Um, so how do you actually like make this spec? So this, so it's maybe interesting to think about how these specs come about, right? The Tim Berners leave to show up and be like, this is HTML 5.0, everyone do this or else. <laughs> right? So what is HTML protocol really between, or what does it describe? I mean, who cares about HTML and how to parse HTML about all these specs? Browser. Browsers, yeah, browser vendors care, right? They, they want to, well, maybe want or not want, right? They want to ensure about how to interpret an HTML document and display it, but who else cares? What was it? The client, so yeah, so the person using the browser cares, right? They want to they want to access the same website whether it's in Firefox or Chrome or on their mobile phone, right? It should still represent the same information. Who else cares? Web developers. The web developers, right? They care about writing an HTML page that is also acceptable to all clients and will render the same and not render differently, right? So, you have this kind of crazy situation where browsers could develop some new HTML tag or some new extension to HTML, some developers can start using it, and then eventually it works its way into a standard and then other browsers have to do that. So it's, HTML really, so the very first version was kind of Tim Berners-Lee saying, okay, this is how I think HTML should be done, but after he did that, and other people create browsers and other people extend the language, um, it grows and grows over time organically. And so these standardization ref efforts are really just trying to capture, they, they're working groups that try to come to consensus. So they have representatives from browsers and web developers, all these kind of people who talk about what things people are trying if they want to try new things. So anyways, it's an interesting look if you try to think about like, why is this crazy feature in here? Oh, it's because Netscape decided to do that in 1996 and we're stuck with it. So good luck. <laughs> Okay, so the basic idea of HTML is that you have raw text, which is a text file, that's marked up with tags, which add additional meaning to that raw text, right? So this is kind of like the hypertext. So the basic form of tags, so has everybody seen HTML, vaguely familiar with HTML? Okay, most of you, right? Okay, cool, so this should be a review, right? So tags start with the left <coughs> angle bracket, the name of the tag, and then end with the right angle bracket, followed by some kind of text. So there could be text, there could be nothing in there, uh, there could be other tags, and then finally we'll have the end tag for this, which is a left angle bracket, a slash, that same tag name, and then a right angle bracket. Uh, you can have self-closing clo closing tags, which have a slash at the end, which means this is an empty, this is equivalent to bar, open tag, close bar tag, with nothing in between. Uh, you can also, HTML, so this is where HTML differs from XML, you can have tags that have no end tag, like an image tag. So an IMG tag specifies an image, right, and this has no end tag. So this is one of the things that drove the XML people crazy that they wanted to fix with XHTML. Okay, so if you think about the tags in a document, right, they form a hierarchy, a hierarchical structure, right? We can have nested tags, we can have tags inside other tags, and inside there we can have other tags, we can have sibling tags that are at the same level. Um, and so, look at an example. So in a typical HTML page, you'll have HTML tags, you'll have a head tag, in there you'll have a title, and then you'll have some body with the body of the text, right? So here we can see, so if we're gonna draw this as a tree, the root of the tree would be HTML. It would have two children tags, head and body. Head would have a child tag of title, and title would have, you can think of it, a child of te that text. Okay, so it would look kind of something like this. So this is actually pretty powerful, right? If we're able to just specify all this information to the browser, and the browser knows how to interpret this, that says, okay, this 
title is what I want to be the title of the HTML page. This P is a paragraph, so maybe I want to indent that a little bit um, and separate it from other paragraphs, and maybe I want to do other kinds of styling or whatever. Um, but just as is, we need a little bit more expressivity, right? We Maybe all body tags aren't the same, or all P tags aren't the same. Uh, so this is where we have the idea of attributes, which provide metadata about the tag. So attributes live inside the start tag after the tag name, separated by a space, until the closing bracket of the tag. Uh, so there's four different types of syntax for this. So you can have foo bar, so this just means bar is an attribute of tag foo. Tag foo, I like that. <laughs> Um, so foo is the tag name and bar is the attribute. You can have foo bar equals baz by saying that, okay, foo is the tag name and the attribute bar has the value baz. And you can also single quote baz, which is exactly the same meaning, and you can double quote baz. So each of these means the same thing. So interpret whatever is between those quotes as the value of the attribute bar. You have multiple attributes, you separate them by spaces. So you can have foo, tag foo has attribute bar with value baz, it's disabled, and it's required to be true. So this shows all three syntax in one go. <coughs> Questions on tags, tags, attributes? Cool. So this actually allows us a lot of flexibility in how we can describe an HTML document. Uh, but the core of the HTML document, right, which is the hypertext in HTML is the link, right? We want to link to another document where people can get more information. And so the anchor tag, so this is why if you ever wondered why you use the A tag in an HTML document to specify a link, it stands for anchor. Uh, it's used to create a hyperlink. And so the href attribute, which would be the hyperlink reference, href, is the URI that you want the person to go to. And then the text inside the anchor tag is the text of that hyperlink. Have you ever seen, I mean, you've seen kind of the blue underline, right? Whenever you click a link, this is exactly what's happening. So you have a tag, the A tag, the anchor tag, it has an href attribute, and the value inside that href, the value of that href attribute is the URI that will be interpreted when you click on the text in, inside this tag. So this renders like this in a simple browser. So you could click on this. We kind of all, I think when we instinctively see this, we're like, oh, click, right? Like <laughs> we've been trained so well to know that that is something that's clickable. So when it's on a slide like this, I really want to like push it more. <laughs> okay. So a basic HTML5 page, so starting with the basic HTML5 standard, uh, you specify the doc type. You have a special tag here. That specifies the doc type is HTML. This tells the browser this is an HTML5 page, right? Part of the tricky thing about the web is even though there are all these specifications, right? HTML5, HTML4, a browser today, if you want to run that browser, right? Can the W3C committee force everyone to upgrade to HTML5, all web developers of all the 8 billion, whatever, eight, I don't know how many websites there are? force everyone to upgrade all of their HTML content? No. no, so developers have to be crazy backwards compatible all the way to probably HTML2 or something insane like that, right? So there's all these tricks about, the browser has to try to figure out what, what version of HTML are you using? So this is a way that they've all decided on to tell the browser this is an HTML5 page. Then we have to have it everything included in HTML tags. We have to have a head tag. We have a meta tag that specifies the character set. So why is this important? Because if your page is rendering a UTF character. Like yeah, so what does the browser get this HTML page as? Just bytes from the server, right? They're just bytes coming back. And so how does the browser have to interpret that? Does it interpret as UTF-8? Are you using UTF-16 or, I don't know, some crazy other type of encoding, right? There's all these different types of encoding. So it needs to know how to interpret the rest of that document. The title of the page, well, oh, I should change that. That's fine. Let's change.
<laughs> okay. Then we have the body, and in the body, we just have some link to go to example.com. So let's pause for a moment. Why am I using example.com as a link here? Any URL. There is nothing called example.com. Ooh, there is nothing called example.com. <laughs> You want to check? Does somebody want to go to example.com in their browser? <laughs> wow, you're all infected with malware. <laughs> what is it? It does exist. Yeah, so it's actually, there's an RFC that specifically says if you want to use something in an example, right? Because if you just put a domain name, like badguy.com, that could be somebody's actual address, right? And Or it, even if it doesn't exist now, it could exist later in the future, right? So this is actually a standard, so whenever you have in any of your examples or papers, you should use example.com or .org or whatever you want, one of those domains. Um, they're all owned by the same, uh, I think it's, is it the W3C or the IETF or one of those organizations that owns that domain? What is it? IETF. Okay, the, they're the DNS people, right? They're internet. Assigned the first of four. Right, 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 okay. Okay, so this just describes this language, right? What we looked at describes the basics of HTML. The browser is what's actually responsible for parsing and interpreting that HTML and displaying it to you, the user, right? So your user agent could be <laughs> the browser that we're used to, Chrome, Firefox. It could be the mobile Safari on your phone. It could be uh, a crazy Lynx or W3M, like a console based browser, if that's how you roll. Um, but the point is that it's up to the client, the user agent, to interpret that, those HTML, the HTML page and display it somehow to the user, right? So that page that we saw, we can view it in Chrome. It looks exactly like this. We can see the title is on there with our old title, which I will never be changed from here on out. Um, and it has some text here. And we can view this same page in the links browser. So this is the links browser. It has the title and text here. So we can actually completely just uh, browse the web completely from the command line. Yeah. That's actually kind of cool. It doesn't support JavaScript, though. Uh, it probably does not, which may be a good thing, depending on yeah. how you think about that or feel about that. OK. So what was one problem we looked at with URLs? and us specifying values in URLs and what makes a valid URL? The parsing. The parsing, specifically what about the parsing? The mandatory stuff and the... Right, so distinguishing what was part of the mandatory part of the URLs, right? And what was the data in there, right? And with the special characters, so in the URLs, slashes, question marks, right? Those are all special characters to the URL. So looking at this example, what looks like a special, could be special characters here? The slash, what else? The what? The double quotes? There's a colon, I don't think there's a colon on the page, is it? Oh, 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 yeah, that's good. That's actually, that's a URL, so actually everything that applies to URLs applies in here, right? Yeah, the less than or greater than symbols, right? These signify the starting and ending of tags. Exactly. So what if I wanted to write some, I wanted text to appear on my HTML document, and I wanted it to look as text, and I wanted it to be, like, how do I represent the text left bracket, foo, right bracket? <coughs> right? Because if I use that as is, the browser will say, oh, that's the start of a new tag, right? I'm a browser. I know how to parse HTML. The spec says if there's a less than symbol, then we're starting a new tag. And anything until that right, uh, right angle bracket is going to be a start of the tag, right? So what's the solution to all of this? Encoding. You have to encode it or translate it somehow, right? Just like in URIs, we did percent encoding, right? To percent encode the text. Here, we're going to use that. Of course, it's going to be something different, mm -hmm. right? So there's different specs. So we need to encode this. Uh, so 
In HTML less than five, it's called an entity reference or an entity encoding. Um, it's also called a character reference in HTML5. So there's three types of how to do this. Everything starts with the ampersand symbol and ends with a semicolon. Which is crazy. I, I don't know why they do this. It's just it's probably a historical thing, actually. That'd be interesting to look at. So there's three types. A named character reference, where you say <laughs> ampersand, some predefined name that the specification says exists, and then a semicolon. So uh, I believe the less than symbol is ampersand LT semicolon. Uh, you can also use the numeric character reference. So you do the ampersand, a hash sign, and then the decimal Unicode code point. So this is also the ASCII value, right? So if it's ASCII, whatever, you can put whatever that value is in here, and it will show up as text. Uh, you can also do it the same way with hexadecimal. So this was, you do ampersand, the hashtag, uh, the hash, hashtag. Uh, <laughs> the pound symbol, we'll say, to not get confused. Uh, and X to say hexadecimal. So you did ampersand, pound sign, X41, uh, semicolon. Then it would show the character capital A, because that's what capital A's ASCII value is. OK. This is going to be the cause of a lot of problems. <laughs> Lots of problems. So this is something that you should understand. Okay? And remember, this is again communicating from the application developer to the browser, hey, I want you to parse this thing as text. Mm -hmm. This is not special HTML characters. right? I want you to parse this as text. OK, let's look at some examples. So. Just as we saw in URIs, right? How do we start in a URL with percent encoding? Oh, that's in the name, I just realized. I'm going to say, how do we start a percent encoding? With uh, what type of character? Percent. Percent, because it's in the name. Percent encoding, yes. Which means we have to encode the percent specially, right? Exact same things happens with ampersand. We have to, because the ampersand starts a character reference. So we can't have an ampersand by itself in the language, or in the HTML page. So we have to use ampersand amp. So this is the named reference for ampersand. Uh, or we can use hash uh, pound 38, or we can use pound x26. And we can even do pound x0026. This is the Unicode. It can be as long as you want. Um, so this is the silly e on my last name. The E with the up. Uh, so this is an acute E for the named reference. Otherwise, it's one of these for the other references. So we kind of talked about it a little bit. But why do we need to encode the less than symbol? To interpret yeah, the back. Yeah, and because of the relationship with the tag, right? We want to tell the browser, here I want the symbol less than, right? Or this character left angle bracket. Not, I'm not trying to start a new tag here. Um, so you would do this as, oh, we did this, dollar sign LT. Um, it would also be uh, hash 60 uh, pound X30 or 0030. OK. So with what we've looked at so far, we actually have all of the basics for the web, right? We have pages. Those pages can have links. We can click on those links to go to new pages, fetch new things. Those things will have links. We can click on those things to go to new pages. So everything is awesome. Uh, unfortunately, we need a little bit more expressivity. Uh, we need a, a way, well, as the web evolved, right, for just a text document knowledge representation system, links are fine. Right? You don't really need any more than links. You just have some documents. That document has links to other documents. Right? But this creates a very read-only style of the web. Right? So to actually provide more input to applications, um, HTML has a way to describe forms, which I hope we're all very familiar with. Right? Um, so it has text fields, buttons, checkboxes, range controls, color pickers, any kind of thing you want. Um, but 
its relationship to those three technologies we talked about is very much the same. It's a way to create a complicated HTTP request. So all anchored tags, when you click on them, will make an HTTP get request to the server parsing that URI. And that's it. It will only make a get request on a URL, like uh, a URL you click on with an anchor tag. But forms allow us to actually use more expressive parts of the HTTP language. Um, so the action attribute is just like the href of a link. The action attribute on a form tag tells us where this request is going to go to, what the URI is for that request. Uh, default, if it's not there, is the current URI. So make a request to the current URI. But with the method attribute, now we can change the request and we can tell it, hey, we want to make a post request, right? Or a put request or a delete request. And so, yeah, you can do, actually, I don't think you can do delete uh, in these. Can you? I don't know. You can look into that. I think it's, you can do it with JavaScript. So that's weird. You should be able to. Um, so usually, typically, either get or post. The default, if you don't specify something, is going to be a get. So you have a form tag. The form tag, the attributes of the form tag specify exactly what's going to happen when you submit that form. The children input tags are either transformed. The values that you put into those input tags are either transformed into query parameters, if it's a get request, or the HTTP request body. Remember we saw when looking at HTTP requests that the body, the client can actually send something in the body of that request. And so this is when this happens, is when we fill out a form and set it to be a post. So get passes data in the query, post passes it in the body. And the data is going to be encoded depending on how you set your encoding. Um, not terribly important. Uh, if you need to upload files, you, if you've ever wondered why you have to set certain things on files, it's when you're uploading files, uh, it's the encoding here. So the data, right, just like in URLs, is sent as name value pairs. So data from the input tags, so if I have an input tag with type text, the name is foo and the value is var, it's going to look like this when the browser renders it. So the value inside there is going to be the default value of this input control. And it's going to be a box that allows me to fill in input and has the value bar here. And so when I'll submit this form, it has to turn this into key value pairs. So the key is the name here, which is going to be foo, and it's going to be the value bar. Um, so the value is either going to be the value attribute or if the user types stuff in there, it's going to be the current value of whatever's inside that box. And it'll be the empty string if there's no value. OK. So then we have to encode all name value pairs in the form, right? Because we're using these forms as part of the URI in XWW, in form URL encoding, when making a GET request, right? We're going to use these name value pairs inside the URI. So we need to make sure they're properly encoded. Um, so it's going to use percent encoding, except the incredibly frustrating thing is that, of course, it's slightly different. It does percent encoding, except that spaces are translated to plus instead of percent 20. You say, why, professor? I don't know. This, this is how it was done. I can probably always say like weird historical accident, and I'll be correct for like 90% of things. <laughs> So in our case, that'll be foo equals bar will be sent as the data there. And just like in URLs, multiple name value pairs are going to be separated with ampersand. So it's going to be foo equals bar and, I don't know, other key equals other value. So if we look at this, if we have a form that's action is example.com slash grade slash submit, we have an input type that has the student, a name of student, value of bar, an input type of class, and the grade, and then finally a submit button. So this type of submit tells the browser, hey, this is the thing I want you to click on to submit. So this is going to look like this. This is going to be a very simple form. This first input field is going to have the value bar, right? And so if I fill this in something like with Adam Dupay, CSE 591, A plus, 
because that's the grade I definitely want in my other class. Man, I gotta stop putting class names in here. Um, this will generate, when I click this submit, it's gonna generate or request this URI, right? The browser automatically does this translation and it's gonna make a get request to example.com grade submit student equals Adam. So you can see the space here got translated to a plus ampersand class, the plus here, the grade, the plus here, right? Why did this plus get changed? Yes, because it's an actual plus and not a space. I wonder if it's for space, like space reasons of the request, because translating a space to percent 20 is three characters, but replacing it with just a, a plus sign is only one character, maybe that's why they did it. I don't think we had this percent encoding. Ooh. That's a good question. I um, think the plus was actually a remnant of that. And I know IE used to automatically, when you use plus, it would change it to percent 20. Right, mm -hmm. which is also valid. That's mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Um, I know part of the reason is they wanted URLs to have no spaces in them explicitly. So that way you could write down a URL and give it to somebody, right? Without that, if you have spaces, well, how many spaces and all that. So. Uh, at least that part I know of why they didn't want spaces, but I don't know which came first. So we'll check that. Okay, so if we look at a post though. Now here we have a post method. We have the same exact values of our form in our input field. The only thing that's changed is the post. Now when I fill in this input field and I click submit query, now it's gonna generate an HTTP request. And this HTTP request is gonna look like a post request to grade submit it's gonna set the host name as example.com, and then it's going to set all these headers. It's gonna tell it that it encoded this with the form URL encoding, just like before. But then why does it have to specify the content length here? So it's gonna send, it's gonna be a new line, right? End of header, and it's gonna be this thing that we just sent. So why does it send the content length? <laughs> Maybe give people, I mean, 
So this is actually a very powerful idea, right? Is we can run code depending on what their response is, and as long as we output an HTML page, then their browser, any browser will be able to access that software, right? So when you develop like a C application, right, or a Linux binary, it only works when you compile it, it only works on that operating system, right, and on that physical hardware that you compiled it on. But if I say, well, actually, as long as whatever program you write, as long as I can access that program through HTTP requests, mm -hmm. and as long as I get HTML responses, <coughs> then I don't care as the person running the browser, I don't care what language it's written in, right? You can write it in C, you can write it in assembly, you can write it in Erlang or Python or whatever you want, and it will still work. Um, and actually, the early web was um, designed specifically to allow this. And one of the view, one of the kind of case studies of the early web was to allow people access to a database via the web, right? So you want to be able to interact with the database and to allow a web application to do that, or to allow use the web protocols to do that. Um, and actually, when you look at the early specification for what get and post mean. Right? If you're just building a document storage, all you need is get. Right? Because get says a get request should not have the should not have the significance of taking an action other than retrieval. Right? This means the server must not should not do anything except for return some result. Right? So this means it should be safe. What does item potent mean? No, mul multiple get requests will also return the same thing. Yeah, so it means so it means the similar thing. It means that I believe it means uh, if you make the identical request multiple times, it's the same as running that request once, right. right? In effect, that means it shouldn't change anything over time. Um, but yeah, it means that if I make one get request to the identical URI, if I make a hundred of those requests, it should always give me the same result. Whereas a post request says, oh, a post request specifically they said should be used to annotate existing resources, posting a message to a bulletin board, news group, mailing list, uh, and provides a block of data such as the result of submitting a form to a data handling process, right? This is like already getting to the fact that we want applications to handle and process this data. And extending a database through an append operation. Um, so, the key, I've been thinking, I mean, this is, uh, this is really what I did my PhD on, right? Is on web applications and web applications security. So I've tried to think a lot about what is, like, what is the core of a web application. And so really, the core to me is server-side code dynamically creating an HTML response. Right? So there has to be some kind of code or something that's happening. Right? Uh, to dynamically change and create this HTML response. And so how does this differ from, what do you think of when you think of a website? Like the term website. Static page. Yes, a static page. I kind of like, well, I think the original Yahoo was just a collection of links to various places. Um, right, I mean it was updated, they would update that, but so we're going to be, from here on out, we're going to try to be very precise when we talk about these things. So this is why I specifically always use the term web applications, right? Because it conveys that this is a dynamic application just like any program you're running, like Outlook or whatever, on your, your computer, right? These are applications that expect input-output. They just happen to use the web to provide those services. Whereas to me, a website is something just stupid and dumb and HTML-based. So, we've looked at the HTTP protocol, right? So every, right, when I make a request to the server, right, I say, hey, I want this resource, I want this method, and I'm speaking this version of HTTP, and then maybe I tell you my user agent or something. Right? And then when I want to make another request, 
right? I don't go, hey, you remember me from two minutes ago? Like I just requested this thing, now I want this image file. No, we make a new request and we say, hey, I want to get requests, I want this, this um, image, and I'm speaking HTTP 1.1, and here are my headers, and maybe here's my user agent, right? And so the server knows, the server sees all HTTP requests coming in, right? These are on TCP, so it knows the client's IP address, at least externally, right? It knows the external client IP address, and it knows basically the user agent. When you use an application on your computer, when you boot up Outlook, every time you interact with it, do you have to tell it who you are? No, why not? Yeah, embedded where? In the session or in Outlook? I don't know, let's think about an email client, right? It has to store that somewhere, right? So if you think about it, the application, Outlook is storing some state, right? The very first time you open it up, it's a brand new time, and I think the first window it shows is, hey, you wanna use a mail client, so you need to tell me your credentials so I can go check your mail, right? And then it stores that permanently, right? So next time you close and open it, it looks and it knows, okay, you're this person, you have these mail accounts, right? Imagine how horrible it would be if every time you open Outlook, you had to type in your email information, your username and password, it would have to re-go download and sync your email, and then you close it down and everything goes away and you start it back up, right? It'd be kind of like, well, um, and so this is the key problem with the web, right? From the server's perspective, all it sees is a new request. Maybe it came from that same IP address, maybe not. Maybe you moved your browser from Wi-Fi to your phone's hotspot, right? It sees a brand new request. Um, it's kind of like, has anybody ever seen that movie Memento? It's an older movie. It's about a guy who loses his capability to uh, form long-term memories, right? This is like what a web server is like. It completely, every time you make a request, goes, hey, what are you, how are you, how are you doing? And you make another request, it's like, hey, how are you, how are you doing? And you're like, dude, I just saw you like five seconds ago, right? This is the key problem with the basic protocols of the web, is there's no state attached to any of these requests. And so maintaining state is actually one of the core parts and enabling technologies of how you actually build these web applications. Fundamentally, HTTP is a stateless protocol, right? The requests that your browser makes are not linked in any way to each other. And because of that, the server has to treat you like you're a brand new person every time it sees this request. So do we need this? Can we write applications without this? Without that, oh, just oh. using HTTP as is. Right, we haven't looked at anything about how to do that. I mean, it would be a terrible user experience if nothing else. Why? No, totally. it would be yeah. What do you mean? Oh, that's not a third hand. Uh, Slow, terrible user experience. Yeah, you have to, well, just using the protocol, I mean, you can't just do that, you can't even do that even with HTTP because there's no way to link those two requests. So mm -hmm. even the client IP address, right? So a lot of us actually, if you're on the wireless, you're coming from the same IP address. So remote servers see the ASU NAT IP address. Right, some unique identifier in each URL that you request. Yeah, this is what, yeah, okay, actually that is uh, one of the techniques that people did use at the start was okay, the first time you interact with my application, I'm gonna embed in every link on my page, I'm gonna embed some secret information or some random number. So that way when you click, I see from that request, I see that random number, I can look it up and I can see that yes, it is this person. Uh, this is that same person. So yeah, you can actually completely change the links on the page in order to support this. But let's think about even without, do we want stateless applications? 
What are some examples of applications that don't have state? Are they useful? HTTP. What is it? Just API. Video. Help state. I can't hear what? API. API? REST API. REST API. Ah, 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 ah. REST APIs. Uh, yeah, but what's an example? That's just like a type of application. Video streaming. Video, yeah, YouTube. You could use YouTube without logging in, right? Skype. Would it, Skype? Ooh, Skype is tricky. I don't know that I call it a web application. Right? Um, even Google, right? You could use Google without, I mean, you, you used to be able to use Google without logging in, right? And then you just say, hey, I want to search for this thing, and it gives you results, right? It doesn't need to know that you were the person who searched for that thing five weeks ago. Yeah. It does know that, and so it can give you better search results, right? right? But there are actually a lot you can do without state, right? Not every application has to have state. But if you want to have user accounts or any kind of linking of users, right, to build these kind of rich applications, you need some notion of state. And really, when we think about state, we need to kind of link requests together. Right? and say, okay, what requests did you make in the past? Right? We want to see, are you a brand new person or did you make some requests in the past? And the goal, as somebody said, right? so we really want to make some kind of session right? so that the server can say, oh, you're this person and you made these requests and I maybe created an account for you and so I can store your preferences just like Outlook does. Right? Um, so we can allow us to do authentication, right? So it can allow us to have username and passwords. Uh, it can actually allow us to have rich, full, interactive applications that aren't just requesting data, right? They can be personalized to us. So there's kind of three ways that have been tried to achieve this, right? One way we've talked about is embedding information in URLs. Um, another way is to have hidden fields in forms. So I didn't talk about it, but the input fields on a form can, the type can be hidden so it's not shown to the user. So that, that way you can put the session value in there. And the third way, the way that actually uh, is the most common that we're going to talk about is using cookies. Uh, unfortunately, we're not talking about cookies you can eat. So I'm sorry. I know it's before lunch. I just got kind of hungry to talk about it. Um, so the idea is cookies were, this is one of those things that was developed by Netscape because they thought it would be cool. It wasn't the committee that decided we needed this feature. It was Netscape realized this was a problem for people developing e-commerce applications. And so they developed with their browser this technology, and this is why we have this today. Um, the idea is cookies are state information that's passed between the web server and the user agent. So basically, the server initiates a session by asking the user agent, hey, store this value, some opaque value that means nothing to the user agent store this, and the next time you make a request, give that back to me, and that way I know who you are and I can link those requests. Um, and either the server or the user agent can terminate the session. So this is part of cookies, right? You can, anybody ever clear their cookies to fix their computer or something? Yeah, right, it's kind of crazy that they still have us do that, and that it actually does work. Um, so 1997 was the first standardization attempt for cookies. Uh, 2000 tried to standardize cookie 2.0 by consolidating all these different implementations. There's a lot of weirdness here. Um, there's actually a great RFC in April 2011 if you're in any way interested in the web and um, the evolution and want to get some insights into here about cookies describes how they're actually used in the modern web um, and how different browsers implement them and what kind of things they mean because there's actually, they're incredibly complicated, surprisingly, I mean, or maybe not. And so cookies are name value pairs, right? Web's great, name value pairs, it's like name value pairs all over the place. Um, and so the server says, includes in an HTTP response a set cookie header to ask the user agent, hey, please set this cookie, and so when you contact me again, send me back this cookie. So it can set a cookie like user equals foo. Then the user agent, when it talks to that server again, it'll use the cookie header and put this value user equals foo. So it will send a value of cookie colon user equals foo. And Servers can ask for multiple cookies to be set. So I can say, hey, set these things. Like maybe I want your 
language preferences to be on there. Um, and this is where it gets confusing. So a server can set attributes on cookies. Like it can specify the path. So it can say, okay, on this domain that you're talking to me, store the cookies, but only for this path. So only use cookies, this specific cookie when you're talking on this path of the application. Um, the domain, so cookies can be maybe valid for domains or subdomains, right? So I may want to set a cookie on google.com that you can access on drive.google.com when you talk to there. Um, expiration, how long I want you to keep that cookie around for. Um, HTTP only, so do I want the cookie, so I want that JavaScript, we're not gonna get that yet, but JavaScript should not be able to access this cookie value, it should only be used in the HTTP request response. Secure, only ever send this cookie over secure connections. So only over HTTPS, never send it over HTTP. So let's look at an example, then we'll kind of go back and talk about this. So, when I did this a while ago, curl, using curl command line tool to access google.com, it gave me set cookies of preference equals ID equals this thing, um, expires this time, path, domain, another set cookie. And so uh, we can see that this is the actual value of this. And we can actually see they're embedding more values in the value of that cookie, mm -hmm. right? In this preference equals. So this is the key preference and this is some opaque value that means something to Google, right? So you can see they're actually parsing this again by separating with colons, it looks like. <laughs> um, I don't know, if any of you end up working at Google and you want to tell me exactly what's going on here. <laughs> That would be cool. Uh, we have the expires header, we have the path, the domain. And yeah, so this way it includes google.com, drive.google.com, all Google subdomains. Um, this one has an HTTP only flag, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, and the server can ask that the client delete the cookie by setting an expires date in the past. The user should delete that cookie. Uh, proxies are not supposed to cache cookie headers. So why wouldn't we want proxies to cache cookie headers in responses? Unauthorized login. What do you mean unauthorized login? Like you can use the cookie to get login into some other account. Uh, yeah, we're not talking about logins or anything right now. So just about sessions, right? Why would that be? Multiple people using the same proxy. Yeah, exactly. If you have multiple people using the same proxy, it goes back to that, the problem of, well, when we talk about using cookies for authentication, mm -hmm. right? But we have multiple people using one proxy, they're all going to get the same cookie, which then defeats the purpose of oh. cookies to identify a session, right? So they'll all have the same session. Cool. All right. Let's stop here. And on Monday, we will continue.